Like that music that comes to us from the talented mind and hands of uh, Horace Tapscott, who we have in studio as our guest on this, the most current edition of Night Journey. And uh, I'd like to first say um, hello, Mr. Tapscott, or Horace, which do you prefer? Horace is just fine. Okay. How are you today? Just fine. Okay. We're also in studio with uh, Michael Wilcott. Wilcott. How are you doing? Pretty good, and we'll introduce you to the rest of our audience a little later in the program. But for now, I'm going to concentrate these questions uh, on uh, a Horace. This uh, tune we heard, it, you didn't write this one, Close to Freedom. Who, who did write this? No, uh, Carmel Crunk, one of the uh, community composers, mm -hmm. uh, he uh, wrote this, one of many things that we've recorded of his. And he has been uh, quite a, 
a writer for many years since the early 50s mm -hmm. so we thought we'd start trying to do some of his music sounds i like that sound that was you playing piano true right, right. yeah that's nice uh and roberta miranda was our bass violinist and sonship theus uh, on drums yeah he was at the Lobero Theater in Santa Barbara, California. It was nice. Did you have fun there? Great fun. Great fun. Yeah. Good recording, too. Yes, it's good recording. The piano is triple A, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, uh, the audience was very receptive. That's nice. That's nice. Um, this wasn't then the group backing, uh, you understand, wasn't the Pan African, Pan African People's Orchestra then? Well, it was pieces of it. Pieces you know, of you it. know, we had the orchestra, and you break it all the way down to a soloist. Mm -hmm. You know, you utilize every individual that had something to contribute in the orchestra. You know, the orchestra itself is is at the at the stage of being in the thirties of thirty people at this point in time. However, you know, the initial goal is to reach it, to seventy five to a hundred people for the orchestra to become some kind of institution. For those people who don't know what the uh, orchestra is about, can you give us a brief biographical sketch of... Well, yes, it's it's, it's a, a group that we call the Pan-African People's Orchestra, the orchestra uh, being spelled with an A-R-K, significant to the savings of, uh, and to preserving the, of the music that was done by Afro-Americans. Mm -hmm. Music and poetry and all kinds of literature, these all these things are involved. However, the orchestra itself, it was consisted of, at the beginning of it, when it started in 1959, mm -hmm. we had about 30, 35 musicians in it. And it was a, a sort of a new kind of a coming together of uh, all these different artists, putting their, contributing their pieces to this, this giant pot, you know, and after that happened, we started having quite a, built a quite a repertoire on, uh, on original music, mm -hmm. you know, written by uh, local people and and some people that have been, you know, unheralded through the years. Most of the musicians, and can I assume, that are in the orchestra at this time are L.A. musicians, some with uh, some national recognition, but largely local musicians from the community. Largely local from the community, mm -hmm. yeah, that's correct. And those who have gained that national recognition still uh, have uh, their own responsibilities and obligations to this orchestra, mm -hmm. wherever they may be in the world. Could you um, just, uh, again, for our, our audience's uh, uh, ed edification, tell us some of the some of the names who have come through the orchestra, some who are still there, who have perhaps gone on to other things? Oh, some of them, are like people such as uh, 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 Azar Lawrence and uh, Dadisi Woods, uh, Arthur Blythe, uh, uh, from... George Bohannon, Lester Robertson, to uh, quite a few uh, other, Wilbur Morris, mm -hmm. Butch Morris. Uh, these I've named, the last few I've named are, you know, around the country and overseas and places of that nature. And, you know, and there are quite a few that live up in San Francisco, and some of them have started orchestras around in the areas they live in. Mostly one in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh. There's a there's a group there that uh, has, wants to be Ugma too, because of the principles of the Ugma Foundation. And now that leads me to the next question, of course. What is Ugma, and uh, what is your involvement with Ugma? Ugma itself is an acronym, uh, Union of Gods, Musicians, Artist, Ascension. Mm -hmm. uh, in the early 60s, about 1961, it was called UGMA, the Underground Musicians Association. That being because uh, these were artists, black artists within the community that had quite a bit to offer, but there was no place to put it. There was no place to have it honed into something, you know. And so we come together, and the music that we played and the 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 kinds of shows that we would put on that would uh, involve the other artists, like the painters and the dancers and mm -hmm. the uh, uh, poem uh, poem people those people, the word musicians, mm -hmm. uh, we would, and showing slides and things early in the early 60s, late 50s, we were trying to put across a whole picture of, uh, of, a, of a whole thing that comes out of community. You know? right. 
We did this on our own. We did this without any state or federal funds. <laughs> any state, city, or federal. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it comes out. It was what you call fun pockets. <laughs> you know, fun from pockets. You know. <laughs> and you know, we stayed together quite a while because we we believed in what we were doing, and 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 because of that, a lot of the music today that's on the market is because it's what it is because of those kinds of groups and this one for sure here in Southern California. UGMA is still then together. UGMA is still together. UGMA it hasn't met in the last two or three years because of an illness that I had gotten myself and it put me out of commission for mm. about four years. See. However, the the uh, the music part of UGMA was still going on until the hurricane came through on Broadway and wiped out this tea room that uh, the foundation still had mm. some goings on. That this one that past March first, uh, yes, yeah. that one. Yeah, and so now <coughs> we have to start from you know from scratch again. But you know we were in the process of reorganizing and trying to readjust to the way things are at this time. Okay, we're in studio with Horace Tapscott, and he's telling us about UGMA and about the Pan African Pan African People's Orchestra, and we're going to hear some of Mr. Tapscott's music right about now, Flight 17.
Flight 17. And uh, can you tell us who wrote this song and what's the story behind it? Well, it was a young sir named Herbert Keith Baker that wrote this uh, particular composition, Flight 17. Mm -hmm. And at, it was just about the time that uh, right after he wrote this, that it's when he had the fatal car wreck. He was at the age of 17 as well. Mm -hmm. He would come by my home. His father would bring him by and to help him to write his music out. So we, after his death, of course, we put this together with the orchestra, you know, to... For him, for his sake, he has. He was such a, a talented youngster, you know, very talented. I mean, more so than just a regular talented youngster. He mm -hmm. had the extra thing about him, you know. He, his playing at the age of seventeen, you would think he was in his late thirties, you know. Just he was a very gifted youngster. Listening to this composition, it amazed me that could you know spring from the mind and the hands of somebody seven, 17 years old. Right. You know? I think I was playing basketball then, and, <laughs> <laughs> and that was about all. Uh, who are some of the musicians who worked out on this? Well, uh, Adele Sebastian was our flautist. Mm -hmm. She was playing the top flute, and there was Jesse Sharps. He was doing the, uh, uh, he's the band, he was the band leader at the time, and he was playing soprano and uh, bamboo flute. And then, of course, Linda Hill was doubling on piano. Mm -hmm. And then there was uh, James Andrews playing tenor sax and clamp bass clarinet. Michael Sessions was playing alto saxophone. Kofi Larry Roberts was playing flute. Herbert Calise was playing alto clarinet. The legendary Red Calendar was playing tuba. Uh, young, one of our youngsters, uh, Archie Johnson, was on trombone. And then, of course, the legendary Lester Robertson on trombone. And Everett Brown Jr. was playing drums, along with William... Madison playing drums, and Louis Spears was playing cello, and David Bryant was on bass, and on the other bass player was Kamonte Lawrence Polk. That's quite a roster. Yeah. yeah. What year are we talking about this recording to take us? I think uh, we're talking about 1970, uh, about 75, I think, mm. six. Flight. Flight 17. Flight 17 was titled the album as well, right? That's right. And this was recorded on Nimbus Records? Yes, it's on Nimbus Records. Tell us about Nimbus. The story. With, what's the story there? Well, Nimbus Records is 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 an uh, uh, organization. Uh, I mean, a record company that's started out of the uh, the community. Mm -hmm. uh, a very very much of a music lover, uh, a person who enjoys the black classics. His name is Thomas Albach, and he. Uh, he and I used to speak about the recording the orchestra years ago while we were doing our concerts at the Emmanuel United Church uh, on 85th and Holmes. Mm -hmm. Reverend Edgar Edwards was the pastor, and we uh, we we started recording there. We started with one and two to see how it worked. It was more or less a, a, a nip and tuck kind of thing, you know. You tried and didn't let it lay a while then you try it again mm -hmm. until we got to a point where the orchestra itself was ready for this kind of adventure mm -hmm. and Albach and myself we got together and we uh, started putting these albums together it got to a point where we were doing them for the sake of the archives of course right. you know, re regardless of the sale Sales, thing yeah. of course we would like for them to sell but the first idea was for the archive of projects mm -hmm. And uh, uh, to this date, number since the early, the, the middle part of the 70s, we've got about 12 to 13 artists, I mean, uh, albums out. Mm -hmm. And uh, and most of the artists are from the community. There's uh, one for, about Gary Bias, a very right. gifted player. Uh, uh, the very talented uh, Miss Linda Hill has an album out okay. on Nimbus. Also, the awful talented brother Kaif. Rusadon, mm -hmm. the Bob Crowley and his sister B.J. Crowley have an album out on Nimbus, very good album. Also on Nimbus, they have uh, the gifted Roberta Miranda has two uh, solo albums. Well, he has a solo album and uh, an album which he uses as a group with him, as well as uh, myself. Myself, I, I recorded about three, about four, five, six albums with Nimbus and uh, they seem to be uh, working their way toward some kind of recognition, at least amongst 
the music people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, around the country. And we have it, uh, I would say we have a by we have it by the handle because it's not the kind of a running and uh, busting your head kind of a, a job. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of thing that you want to put together and you know how to put it together and you have this liberty to do so. Because you can be creative without you can be creative. worry about the uh, the dollars or the bottom line of the you record company. Yeah. Because of the independence of it, we you know we seem to be able to pull, uh, pulling more people into us because they really know coming from this company, it's it, whether you like it or not, it will be from the creative point of view. Yeah. I like the fact that it's just a, a chance to document some of the music that would otherwise be lost. No one would, you know, I know the companies, the way the industry is now, they're not going to record something, especially when the artist has complete creative control. First and foremost. <laughs> <laughs> right. I noticed on the, on the album, Flight 17, there's a, a little logo there, a pyramid under the, just above the Nimbus label there. And I wonder what that, what the, what's the significance of the pyramid? And I see Ugma written over the top there. And can you, I'm going to turn to now Don, excuse me, Michael Wilcott, so he can, uh, First, give us your your association with Horace Tapscott, and then also, can you give us a little information about the? Uh, sure. Uh, in 1971, I was approached by Horace Tapscott, Linda Hill, and Arthur Blight, and a couple of other artists, Ray Strada, Ernest Strada, mm -hmm. to uh, produce a brochure on UGMA Foundation. This brochure was an uh, explanation of the foundation with pictures and uh, various uh, articles, poetry. And it was circulated amongst the uh, college campuses, mainly on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, the purpose was to solicit jobs and to get the art out of the community and to a farther realm. Uh, I've been associated with uh, UGMA and Horse since then. The uh, significance of the pyramid uh, is the carriers of the culture, the uh, artists encompassing not only musicians, but photographers, writers, technicians, did various artists, and, and housed in a foundation, and this foundation spreading the culture throughout the world. So that was the significance of the pyramid. Okay. We're in studio, of course, with uh, Horace Tapscott, uh, leader of the uh, Pan-African People's Orchestra, and you just heard words from uh, his associate, Michael Wilcox, who's a graphic artist technician and helped develop the, the logo and some of the uh, concepts behind the uh, Ugma, I guess that's safe to say. Yes. <laughs> right. At this time, we're going to hear from uh, Horace and more music. Uh, I think this tune we're going to hear is called The Isle of Celia. <laughs> Thank you. 
that melody yeah that's nice the isle of celia yes to give us a story about that horace please the isle of celia was written for my wife celia tapscott mm. and she's uh was from the islands her father was born in the islands and he was uh, never became an american citizen and, and so that meant that uh, perhaps she had an island in the caribbean someplace and she's been going there for years mm. to try to find it <laughs> However, you know, that, that line was written many years ago, like 1956 or 57. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time, Sonny and Chris wanted to record that one. And that was recorded, you know, just about uh, about four years ago, I would say. And uh, with Larry Gales was on bass and Ray Crawford was playing uh, guitar. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Smith, the drummer Jimmy Smith, and of course, Dolo Coker. Mm. Was playing piano. Uh, it was a, it was a nice day. It was very fruitful, and you know, he did some more things, but they never did get it released. Yeah. That's a shame. That's a, a nice, nice tempo, nice feel. I like that. That's me, you know, all over. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about you now. Your uh, personal beginnings. When did you start in in music? Well, let's say, uh, I would have to say it was forty three years ago, mm. and I was about uh, six years old. And my uh, my mother, being the jazz pianist of those days, naturally she was uh, trying to put it on some of her children. And I happened to be the one. I got started. It was in Houston, Texas, and but and she started teaching me piano. Mm -hmm. And of course, I didn't want piano because it was too much of a sissy's <laughs> right. aim. You know? Okay. Be a violin and piano in those days, you couldn't play it and walk down the street. Hey, I'm a former violinist myself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so by being, you know, by being involved, just naturally, seemingly, you know, without realizing, I would have to go to concerts every week. And each week I went to a concert, my mom would take me to this concert. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one one concert, they had they were playing a composition 
the William Tell Overture, and they had a, a, a part in there where they utilized the trombones and they sounded so masculine. Mm -hmm. I pulled the dress tail and said, that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. During those days, my mom worked in the, in the school and she was making $9 a week. So she saved up all of her paycheck each week, you understand me? And bought me this trombone for $40 from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And that's when it all got started. And then of course we, Join the migration in 1943 and 4 to come to Los Angeles. And uh, the same thing continued on. The first thing that was was looked for before I got here was a music teacher, you know, before I came to California. Mm -hmm. She had found me one. And as soon as I got off the train, I went to meet my music teacher. Who was that? His name was Harry Southard. He was a barber on 51st and Central Avenue. Mm -hmm. And he taught music on his time off and he taught me you know and then he started uh, passing me around to different people did he teach you uh trombone or piano or just music theory or everything well, he taught me trombone mm -hmm. he was into the trombone and uh, meanwhile i had these these other so-called uh well i guess you would have to call them like many people have different professors to teach them well i had the same kind of thing by being in the same neighborhood as the black Union was in mm -hmm. those days when it was segregated, local 767. So every musician, every black musician that played an instrument came through that. And that was a, just a, a run from my home. <laughs> and it was between my school and my home. You know, and I had to go to school, pass it, and come back home, pass it. Mm -hmm. So I'd have my instrument each time coming home. And Gerald Wilson, when they pulled me off the street and asked me, could I play this? So that started that. He started picking me up and at night, asking my mom to let me go to rehearsal. And I was amongst all these people, you know, and that was my, along with myself, it was Eric Dolphy, and Frank Morgan, and uh, uh, um, the drummer, Larry Lawrence Marble. Mm. We were the youngest people in the group. You okay, understand? yeah. And in that band, of course, Wardell Gray and Dexter Garden, mm. and Ernie Royal, and Marshall Royal. Uh, just a few names. Just huh? a few names. <laughs> just to name a few. And, you know, the trombones, Melba Liston, and all these people were there, man. And I had all of these. They had made sure that the youngsters copped, for sure. One of the youngsters who did cop was Horace Tapscott from that group, and we're going to hear some more of his music, this track called Jenny Spirit Waltz. <laughs> Thank you. 
has that et- ethereal sound that mm. the spirits did. Jenny Spirits Waltz, right. Horace Tapscott. That's your line, or someone else wrote that? That's the one I wrote. I wrote that one for my aunt. She was Aunt Jenny Lusk. She was uh, one of those uh, ladies that went to the, uh, what do you call it, the Sanctified Church, like on 33rd and Compton. Mm-hmm. You know, the ladies would wear all the white. She had white hair and all those white clothes, and she wore black glasses. Mm-hmm. And she was, you know, partially blind, but she was clairvoyant. You know, she would never let me leave the house without telling me what's going to happen to me that day. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. So naturally, she, her spirit still walks around. But well, that tune fits then. You know, that's that's an apt description. So, uh, what what project does this come from? What album? This is from the uh, Tapscott Sessions Volume One uh, on Nimbus Records. Mm. It's uh, being uh, it's it's not been released as of yet, but uh, it's uh, it's on the market almost. Now. And, and then there's a Volume Two. Mm-hmm. We have volume one and volume two, and it has the first one has Jenny's spirits waltz on it. Mm-hmm. That's nice. Uh, I'm also curious about your involvement with uh, Crossroads. Can you give us uh, some information about Crossroads that? Academy? That, that's the uh, theatrical artist school is located on uh, eight at the 8461 South Vermont, mm-hmm. and it's run by Sister Angela Gibbs and and and, uh, and her associates. You know. Uh, her mother, Margaret Gibbs, and myself, we, uh, out of the Ugman Foundation, we we tried to put together something the community could hold on and the community could run. Because it, during those days, that was during the time of my illness, and, you know, at that time I was, we were going to try to delegate some of the responsibilities around. Mm-hmm. So here, and right now, it's Crossroads Academy is one of the, main uh, 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 objects that comes out of that and they have uh, day-to-day functions going on all day it's it's uh, the telephone number seven five oh seven five uh, uh, oh you're on the spot now <laughs> <laughs> we'll get the number out yeah, we'll later. get the number out and, uh, but uh, actually and they you know they're active uh, all the way through the week I think Fridays is the only day that's closed uh, I see yeah. You got your finger in a lot of different pies here, then uh, musically and otherwise. Well, it, it all has to do. It all comes from uh, having community awareness. Mm-hmm. All of this builds out of that. You know, some of those things has has to happen the way they happen before they can become aware of. And True. Nothing can become more aware of than longevity and uh, uh, productivity. True. You know, yeah. and that, that's. Uh, the emphasis that we set on it, it's like a turtle's walk. You know, it's it's not fast at all. It takes a little while and it takes a lot of courage and a lot of uh, strength, you know, to to believable the kinds of powers, you know, to believe and to be able to, to see what's happening and, and see if it's taking effect. If it gets to one, then you know, then it's working. Sounds like the ingredients to a uh, classic, yeah. classic sound. Well, that's that's exactly where we're working for Barry to make all these these things that come out of the Afro American race of people in this country and their con- contributions to this country to be uh, uh, documented so that generations you know have something to launch their futures off of something you know that's always here you know mm-hmm. uh, music like the blues and R and B and the so called jazz. All this music is really Afro-American classic music, only made in America, and it was spun off by black people. Mm -hmm. And it should be thought of in such a manner as is the European symphonies, classics. And to have that done, live music must stay alive, and it must be where the people are. It has to go where the people are, and that means street corners and churches, nightclubs, parks, mm-hmm. places, kindergartens, you know, where the children are growing up. It has to be around them, the art, the culture of that people, you know, something that they can grasp on. Words to uh, remember and to cherish from Horace Tapscott, who's our guest in studio, along with Michael Wilcox, and he's been here talking with us for the past hour about... Uh, his life, his inspiration, and his music, and our old enemy time has crept up on us, and 
we're going to get into one last tune called Dial B for Robert, but before we do, I have to pass along the uh, credits with regard to Night Journey. I'd like to thank James Grace for engineering and Pat Rise for our second engineer. Barry Thomas with Night Journey. I'm going to allow you gentlemen to say good evening to us, and we're going to let the tune close. Horace, first yours. Good evening. <laughs> and Michael? Good evening, and good evening to my daughter, Raisha. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you both up. Let's uh, tail out with this nice tune from Horace Tapscott. Thank you for listening to Night Journey Rewind. You can contact me by email, nightjourneyrewind at gmail.com, on Facebook, nightjourneyrewind slash Facebook, or on Twitter, NJR Graves. Please hit the subscribe button. Thank you so much again for listening.